Hey, hey, hey guys, what is going on? This is our second uh, installation, installment episode, whatever you want to call it, of CNT Live. Uh, basically, it is a weekly kind of virtual watch hang, if you will, where um, we collect questions over the week and then we answer them uh, live on Instagram and social medias. So uh, today I have a very special guest. I know, fan favorite. Come on in, come into just the frame. Sit down. Yeah, just sit down. Okay. We're gonna get close here, Tyler. I know how much you love it. Great. Love how much you love getting close. But we've got Tyler with us today, so maybe he'll um, start joining me and us more regularly. Maybe he'll do his own. Uh, but we just kind of wanted to leverage this uh, way to connect with everybody and uh, just kind of answer your questions and all that kind of stuff. We have some watches with us um, and hello. all that stuff. Hello, everyone. What, you're just saying hello? Yeah. Because <laughs> everybody's waving? <laughs> no, I'm just uh, getting a chance to say hello. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, gave, open, I'm you, opening yeah. it up, bro. You gave me this huge introduction. I would just like to be able to say hello oh, okay. to all right. everybody. I'm gonna yeah. move this plant. If you want to maybe, if you want to take this for a quick sec and you can show everybody what's happening. How do we flip this camera around? I love this technology. Here. I'm just going to move this plant out of here because I'm going to try to move this back so that you and I can maybe not sit so close. Not that I don't like sitting close to you, I really do. But the LA showroom is coming together quite nicely. Um, brick by brick, stitch by stitch, piece by piece, it's all coming together. Um, the hi-fi is getting uh, reorganized. We're gonna get some new speakers and all that fun stuff. So, uh, in any case, let's get into it. Do you have your Do you have your phone with you? I have phone, yeah. Do you want to go through some of the questions that people were asking? Uh, some in interesting ones. Sure. So, you want to do a quick uh, wrist check? What are you wearing today? I am wearing a Rolex Datejust. Nice. What's the reference? It's a 1603. It's from 1976. It's a personal watch of mine. Nice. I'm wearing a, a watch that we just got in. I'm really excited about it. Uh, it's an Omega Seamaster. It's oversized. It's uh, kind of like, I guess, a Ranchero, I guess. It's basically the same reference as a Ranchero, but it's not really a Ranchero. I call it like a Seachero. It, yeah, it's like a Seachero. It's basically like an oversized Seamaster, but the cool thing is it has like running uh, seconds hand, uh, run, the running seconds hand at like the six o'clock position, kind of Art Deco. Um, I'm kind of having a little bit of a romance in the current moment with it, so we'll see. Uh, if it makes it to the site, it might, but in any case. One uh, question that we had earlier was, uh, hey guys, why don't you ever you know, post uh, Speedmasters and Seamasters? And it kind of made me chuckle because we actually do. Um, you know, what's funny about inventory and uh, what's, availabil what's available uh, on you know, our site at any given time is that um, it just depends on what's happening and what's available like in the market, yeah, right? What, what we're being offered and, and what's, you know, it, in the condition criteria that we want to provide to our customers. Yeah, for sure. So it, it's like, people are like, why don't you guys buy more Speedmasters or Seamasters? And the, the reality is that like, we're looking for that stuff all the time. Matter of fact, one thing that is taking up a good amount of our time and one of the things that we spend a lot of time doing is looking for watches for people. So on our website, we have like a, you know, wait list for specific watches and that kind of stuff. And we're out there trying to find watches that might be a birth year watch or a specific reference or things like that. And we're you know ultimately like spending time trying to source watches that meet a specific condition requirement. And that's one of the, the things that I think a lot of our customers um, and you know, clients <clears throat> leverage us for is our eyes and our expertise and stuff like that. So I'm gonna move this just a little bit so that we can get some better audio. We're just doing this with a phone for right now, but I'm gonna move this up and see if this helps. I'm gonna try to like get that. All right, cool. Um, so you wanna go through some of your questions? Um, yeah. I got, got some good ones. <laughs> Uh, so for people who don't know me, I've been kind of in the behind the scenes of Craft and Tailored for uh, about four and a half years. Um, 
and I've been selling watches probably for about three and a half years now. Um, but recently uh, we have started a new channel or a, a new series on YouTube where I go through under the radar pieces. So uh, you'll be seeing a little bit more of me as, uh, as time goes on. Um, so I guess the whole point of this live stream was to ask me questions. To get to know me, I guess. But I think the funny thing, if I can preface what you're gonna go through with some of these questions, is uh, I love the internet, but the internet can sometimes be a very weird place. Uh, and I also find myself like watching things or being inspired by different things, and then going like, what pair of shoes or what watch or what car or what shift knob or what steering wheel or what horn button does that guy have, right? So I'm always like looking at that stuff. But um, sometimes people are very interested in. Uh, like what I would think is kind of random stuff. So um, yeah, so why don't we go through some of your questions? Uh, so the first question is uh, the best meal I've ever had. <laughs> and I have no idea uh, what the best meal I've ever had is. Um, I couldn't tell you. Probably some sort of pasta. <laughs> Love carbs. Um, Favorite cocktail of choice? Uh, I'm not a big cocktail person, actually. I don't. You know uh, what one of one of one of your favorite cocktails is? It's a uh, Negroni. Yeah, it's a he's a big Negroni fan, guys. Um, <laughs> don't like Negronis, actually. Uh, I'm not. I'm not a big cocktail person. I like uh, I like Scotch neat for the most part, or or bourbon neat. Um, but cocktails, I'll do a spicy margarita if I'm feeling a little flirty. A little spicy mark. Yeah, a little spicy mark. You know, I, I have seen you do a, 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 a martini on occasion. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it'd be hard pressed to call that a cocktail. It's not really a cocktail. It's just like straight up gin or, or vodka with vermouth, but yeah, it's good on yeah. occasion. Um, my favorite watch is, uh, I'm not sure. That's a very hard question to ask me. Um, I get asked that a lot too. I think we get asked that a lot. Like, what if you could have one watch and one watch only? What would you, what would you have? What would you keep? Oh man, it's so hard to think about that because of the exposure we have with all the pieces that we have in our collection and what we've been exposed to. So it's it's really hard to make that that distinction of, you know, which one stands out the most. Um, Especially because I've never had to think about it. <laughs> I, I've, I've always just been able to uh, wear what Like if you're like, oh, I want to wear a day day or I want to wear something yeah. more sporty or if I want to wear something like whatever, like you. I mean, I, I wear a day just most days um, and it's, it's one of the most versatile and um, easy to wear. And oh! Hi guys, sorry. We're, we're figuring this out as we go. <laughs> kind of all part of the fun. All right, go, go. Uh, Datejust. Yeah, I was talking about the Datejust. It's it's one of the, like the easiest watches to wear and most comfortable and kind of goes with everything. Um, I don't know if you know I had to choose between one watch and, and any watch that was out there what I would really be able to pick. But I know right now I'm I'm really liking Datejust quite a bit. Um, <laughs> People are asking questions, so you can ask a question in here. Uh, we're gonna get back to that one. Books on Time actually has hit us with a great question. Yeah. Uh, you know, the thing I want to maybe say too about that is like we get asked like I think the Datejust is like a really good watch to like have as a daily driver, and I yeah. think that you know people are like, oh well, you know, Kraft and Taylor, they're they're, they're just like saying like Datejust because they have those and that's the watch that they want to sell. The, the reality is is like Ty wears a Datejust, and I think it's one of the most. Yeah. Uh, versatile, flexible, classic, iconic Rolex watches ever produced. I mean, it really, you can really wear this watch uh, with like anything, anywhere. Yeah. And, and it looks great. It's yeah. just super simple, easy. Um, again, I mean, that's just kind of what I'm digging right now. I think it fluctuates. I think probably a week from now, I'll be like, I really like 6538 Big Crowns and I, I just want to have a nice chunky watch on my wrist, but you know, for right now, it's it's the Datejust or um, 
Maybe we oh. should give a we, maybe we should give a watch away. Like I don't know. There's been some like giveaways and stuff. People are asking questions and stuff. So I'm just kind of like bumping back into that. Um. Oh my gosh, more questions here. Uh, how? Do, okay, so we're going to go through some of these other questions. How do you keep your personal watches? How do you choose what to wear among your collection? I think we just kind of went through that, Ryan. Um, but one of the things I'll say is like watch storage is like very interesting. Um, you know, I think for us, like Tyler and I keep our watches in watch rolls. We actually have, um, we have a selection of watch rolls that are actually on our website, which we use personally, but yeah. not necessarily a plug, but it's there. Yeah. If you like them. We actually designed those watch rolls after another kind of design that we saw, but like we're traveling a lot with watches. And I think that like the way that we put the, the roll together actually makes sense. Um, and uh, that's so funny, oh my God. Uh, so um, you should check those out because that's literally how we keep our, keep our watches in, in like the rolls that we sell. Yeah. The funny thing is, is like we eat our own dog food for sure. Like we're not like peddling Alpo and eating, what's another dog food? Purina? Purina, <laughs> I don't know. We eat Alpo, you know? So like, you know, we, this is the real deal. Um, so, um, David Von Bader asks, is it okay to wear his Invicta in the bath? I would say you should definitely wear it in the bath, crown out, maybe even like loosen the case back a little bit. You know what I mean? Uh, not talking total crap on Invicta, Invicta actually has a really interesting history. Um, if you really peel back the layers of the onion on Invicta. So maybe we'll do like an article on that, David. Uh, who also uh, just joined our team. So David is, uh, I guess he's our senior uh, editor, uh, if you wanna put a title to it, but um, really excited to have David as part of our team. So hi David, thanks for, uh, for joining. Um, you wanna like get, go through some watches? Oh, um, there was like a, oh, thoughts on Rolex Thunderbirds. I think they're freaking awesome. I think even more so, like if you wanted a watch that like really kind of blended in between like a sport watch and like more of a dress kind of everyday piece, I think that the Thunderbirds are like really underrated. And also they have a killer history. Like, you know, the Thunderbirds actually wore them. We actually have had uh, an opportunity or two to buy watches that were owned by the Thunderbirds with the actual Thunderbird logo on them. So I think that's, you know, kind of, kind of cool, but I, I think that Thunderbirds are, are really rad and a watch that um, is like really cool, especially if you look at them in steel. I know most people think of Thunderbirds in two-tone, but steel, uh, you know, is, is, is awesome too with a white gold bezel. So um, let's go through some watches. We yeah. pulled some watches that people had some questions on. So uh, hi from Los Angeles, the watch dude, love Scotland. Um, I cannot wait for the world to open back up. I miss uh, the UK and uh, that part of the world. It's an awesome place and it holds a special place in my heart for sure. Um, um, so to start things off, uh, we have a Speedmaster. Yep. So we somebody was saying, you guys don't have any Speedmasters. You guys don't have any Seamasters. Uh, uh, I'm wearing a Seamaster and there's a Speedmaster. Yeah. So I love you. We, but we do. I promise you. I love Omega as a brand. Yeah, this is a really cool one. This is three two one dot over ninety bezel. Kind of a nice patina to the dial. Um, this one is applied logo. Uh, will be coming to the shop very soon. Yeah. Um, I think the the other thing that's interesting to talk about just really quick is like if you look at Omega as a brand. Um, there is a ton of value and a ton of, like you get a lot of bang for your buck with Omega. I mean, Omega can also get very rare and very expensive and is very collectible, but also at the same time, um, like if you look at like a 60s era Speedmaster versus like a normal 60s era Rolex Daytona, like, I mean, I mean the pricing, the pricing is crazy, right? Yeah. So uh, what's next on deck? Somebody asked a question about um, 
1680s, I think 1680s um, from a uh, pricing perspective have really jumped up in the past like two years. 1680s were falling well under the price point of 5513s and Matt Dial 1680s are now getting pretty hard to find. Yeah. And they're jumping up in price, wouldn't you say? Especially in like very good condition with nice patina. Like this one has like very nice yellow patina. It's probably hard to see in this light, but just all around very, very nice condition piece. And to find 1680s that are, you know, unmolested and and without too many service huh? Yes. <laughs> and uh, without too many service parts is can be kind of challenging. Yeah. This one is a, is exceptionally nice. I was kind of surprised when um, you found this one. Tyler, you know, and I are out a lot uh, trying to find watches. And that's another question that we get a lot and also just got is, where do you guys get your watches from? Like, where do you source everything? And the truth to that is, you know, we, you I mean, there's not some like underground, uh, you know, watch network. Like we're, we're I mean, we're, Obviously we have a dealer network, we have a clientele base, but we also are looking for watches like on eBay and pawn shops and watch shops and like Tyler and I will go walk down 47th Street in New York and the jewelry district in LA and, and look for stuff and sometimes it's just right there, right? Sometimes like, you know, having that eye to understand what an unpolished case looks like or, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, like that, that is kind of one of the biggest value adds I would say that we probably provide to the, to the market. Definitely. We Experience. have a couple more questions. You want to read this one here? Uh, I want to get my first vintage Rolex in a couple of years. Which years are kind of the best for vintage eighties, nineties? Um, that is something that you, I can't really tell you. Um, that's something you're gonna have to kind of discover on your own just through research and kind of looking at things and building a perspective. Um, my best advice would be go into vintage shops like ours or um, other shops that are around the world and, and try things on, experience them firsthand to kind of build your own opinion of I like 36 millimeter cases, I like 40 millimeter, I definitely want a sport watch, I want something dressier. Matte um, dial versus like glossy dial or... Totally, totally. Yeah. Uh, you know, what, what era kind of uh, captures what you're looking for out of a piece in terms of, you know, utility versus aesthetic. Um, do you want to go in the water with it? Do you, you know, want something that's more on the collect collectible side? Um, you know, I, I don't have any era that I prefer over another. Uh, but you know that there's specific pieces within each era that I think stand out a bit more. Um, so it's really just uh, kind of figuring out your place in the in the world of vintage watches and Rolex. Yeah, for sure. I, I think the other thing too is like in the '80s and in the in the '90s, that's a very transitional period for Rolex because you have like you know the transition from matte dial into the glossy dial and the sport watches. You have some interesting things like the introduction of sapphire crystals versus like the acrylic or hesalite, quick set dates. So that's actually a good area to look if you want a good first vintage Rolex. And I think your first vintage Rolex, you know, should be something like maybe a date just or maybe like uh, a 14270, like we have a 14270 here, you know, something that's functional, but I think also possesses like a wearability. You know, your first vintage Rolex isn't going to be a 6239 Paul Newman like that's not a really a daily driver, right? That's yeah. not a watch that you can live with. Also, the price point is kind of crazy. Budget really comes into play as well. So, but I think that that's a good era to buy something that is vintage because you have like a lot of things that I think make those watches collectible and ultimately worthy of collecting like the transitional nature of the movement or the design or, or the technical aspects of the watch. Yeah. Um, a couple more questions. We had Alpha or Dauphin Hands from Books on Time. Um, alpha hands, in my opinion. I probably agree, actually. Yeah. Yeah. They're a little bit less common. I yep. don't know. I, yeah. I just, I like Dauphin, you know, not to discredit Dauphin hands, they're also very cool. Yeah, but if you had to choose one, I think yeah. I'd probably go alpha over yeah, Dauphin. Yeah, I, I mean, I have a personal watch that has alpha hands, so. Yeah. Kind of near and dear to me. A um, couple more questions here. Um, so most Moxies asking, I get that four digit subs and GMTs are going up in price, particularly because of modern hype. What is causing the price on the 16 to 55 rising? Um, I would say, you, you want me to answer first or? No, you go first. You're, uh, you're the special guest. Okay. Yeah. 
Uh, what's causing the price on 1655s to rise? Um, I don't know that there's anything that's like super stand out about 1655s rising. Um, it's just that they're a very unique dial variant that Rolex kind of was experimenting with, I think. Uh, and they have always been a very interesting watch. Uh, I've seen like grand entry, uh, like intrigue in 1655 Explorer 2s. Uh, for the past five years, it hasn't really gone down. It's just been a steady increase of people's awareness around the brand or around the reference. And uh, I think that's just kind of compounded over time um, through the community. It, that's, that's kind of what I think. Uh, I would agree. Um, I would say that the other thing too about the 1655 is it's, like you were saying, it's really a standout piece. So if you look at a 1655, there's really nothing in the Rolex catalog outside of the 1655 and now the new Modern Explorer 2 which has that like big orange 24 hour indicator. But like it's kind of its own thing. It's Rolex but it's also kind of not. You know, the dial, the hands, you know, it's, it written, there really, there wasn't like, it wasn't like the 1655 handset could also be seen in like a, you GMT. Know, a GMT or a Daytona yeah. or whatever. It literally is kind of its own thing. So I think that that makes it not only iconic, but also unique and highly collectible as a result of it being kind of in its own design category with Rolex. So I would say that people are becoming aware of that. And then as a result of that awareness, people are consuming them, buying them. Not a lot of them are circling back into the market. And um, that's essentially what's driving the price. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, and also if you think about it, the application of the watch was was so niche, and so few people actually had a need for a watch that had the functions that it that it provided. Yeah. So Rolex provided or, or only produced like a very small amount of them. Wow, we're getting a lot of questions. This is cool. Uh, um, thank you, Everhard fan. We we dress up just for you. Um, we knew you were going to be on this, so I put on a nice coat, and uh, we're both, are you wearing socks today? I'm wearing no-show socks. I'm wearing no-show socks. One of the questions that we got, like, in the feed when we posted in the, in the, the uh, whatever you call it, was, uh, like, why do you guys not wear socks? And we definitely wear socks, you just yeah. can't see our socks. How about that? Yeah. It's all for the, uh, the illusion. It's all for the show. Um, is the 1680 on your website looks like a steal? Is it in good shape? Um, it is on our website. I, this is listed, yeah? Yeah, it is actually. Um, uh, it's from 1979. Um, the case is in really good condition. I love the patina and the insert. It kind of has like an anthracite kind of gray fade. Um, and it has a really nice kind of like warm, I would say custardy patina if you want to like get real fancy with it. Yeah, it's very yellow you know, pinky patina. Up. It's but it's like a light, a nice yellow, yeah. kind, it's not overly white. That's one thing that I think you see in like the later 1680s is like a really white loom. This is not, it's like really, it's it's patinated thing. If that's, is that a word? Patinated, yeah. I think so, I don't know. Um, what do we think about vintage Piaget? I'm in love with those exotic stone dials uh, they made in the 70s and the 80s. Funny enough, we actually, at our last watch show, we were looking at like, I think one or two vintage mm -hmm. Piaget's that had stone dials. And I was like, should we bring one of these into the collection? They're so cool. They're also like kind of cheap. Yeah, there's a there's a tremendous value. You can get like an 18 karat white gold or 18 karat yellow gold Piaget with like a tiger eye dial or like a Malachi dial or a lapis dial. Whereas if you look at Obviously there's less metal, but if you look at a Rolex with an exotic stone dial and a day date or a date just, um, you're looking into the $30,000 range yeah. at this point. Whereas when we're looking at these Piaget's, they're in like the three to $4,000 range. Yeah. So it's, it's a, the price disparity is pretty incredible for very cool and interesting watches, especially if you're looking for that more exotic stone dial aesthetic. Piaget as a brand is cool too. I think we'll probably get more into Piaget just because like, you know, you have like the Piaget Polo and like some of those other watches that are, are kind of like sub icons, I would say. They're icons for the brand, but there's a lot of like really interesting history there. And I think also for a, a brand that kind of dabbles into like the luxury maker jewelry side that is also into the horology offering, I think is also interesting. So um, if that gives you any, um, 
you know, indication about what we think about PJ. We were literally just looking at two watches and we didn't pull the trigger on them, but I think it's kind of a watch that I've been thinking about, you know, yeah. getting into. And especially because like Cartier is kind of also, you know, those smaller kind of tank based watches, something that's like a little bit dressier or, or like the, like vintage paddock is I think popular. I think yeah. that Piaget is kind of the next in line and I think they're still sleeping. So I would yeah. say thumbs up on the, on the vintage Piaget. Definitely. A few more questions guys and then um, we're gonna we're gonna jump here. Uh, Art Deco numerals or Breguet numerals? I would uh, say it depends on the watch for me. Uh, yeah, it definitely depends on the watch. I would say I like Breguet numerals probably a little bit more. Yeah. Um, just because they're so classic and especially if they're applied to the dial, they can age really nicely, especially in vintage. Yeah. But like they're a little fancier, a little yeah. more classic. Yeah, I think of like like vintage Patek with Breguet numerals, and that's kind of like where my mind goes. But uh, thoughts on the new Explorer one thirty six millimeter? I think it's cool. Uh, I mean, this is uh, what's funny is like we were talking about like uh, modern hype versus vintage. Like one four two seven zeros are getting very hard to find, especially with tritium dials. And this is kind of like the original thirty six millimeter glossy dial applied numeral Explorer one. So. I think that that rising tide is also rising the tide of like these the as, well. as well. Yeah. So um, I think that they're cool. Uh, do I agree with like the the price hype? If you want to buy one on the secondary market, I, it's something that like is kind of up to you. I don't really think so. I'd, I'd almost rather have something like this, but that's just my personal preference. And I again lean more towards vintage. We have a couple of questions in the uh, in the box here. Uh, do we believe that aliens are behind the UFOs or are they operated by humans? I don't know, good question. How do you feel about that, Tyler? Uh, uh, probably aliens. You're in, you're aliens. Yeah, I believe in aliens, for sure. You and Tom DeLong. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we've got a couple of questions in the box that we'll go through. Uh, what watch is a sleeper that is gonna creep and appreciate soon? I think there's a lot out there. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it could be uh, anything from, you know, uh, I think like a lot of like the four and five, but, or more specifically like the five digit stuff is definitely creeping, like Fat Lady GMTs, uh, one, six five five zeros. one six five five zeros, especially, yeah, early Explorer 2s, um, one four oh six O's, no date subs, those have climbed, especially Tritium dial. So I would say that like in vintage Rolex, that's kind of a broad question, but like if you're asking vintage Rolex, I would say like a lot of the five digit stuff is definitely you know creeping and still kind of a sleeper. A um, couple more here. Ryan, do we have any watch damage horror stories? My nightmare is to go for a swim and realize the crown wasn't screwed in. Um, yeah, we have some, some horror stories. Yeah. I like it when we know that a watch has been like water damaged and the person's like, no, I didn't take it in the pool. I just woke up and it was, it was like, yeah. it, and I'm like, no. Yeah. <laughs> There's, there's salt water in this, like, yeah. you, like, I mean, I've heard about what wet dreams, but not that wet, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, I love making you uncomfortable. Yeah. I live for uh, it. I mean, we, we see everything just because we're, we're in the heart of the business. So, you know, we've seen bezel inserts break. We've seen people hit watches against door jams. Yeah. We, we had a watch came in, it was actually 1655 that a guy fell on a motorcycle with, uh, and it like, looked like half the watch was just like shaved off because his hand was like dragging against the ground. Yeah. So we, we actually looked at that watch and like appraised it because uh, it, it was an accident and uh, you know, that was uh, like kind of crazy. That was probably the most extreme thing that I've seen where like, yeah. it, like it was just, that was pretty pretty intense. For the um, most part, it's just like a watch fogs up and then you take care of it. So it's it, it's pretty hard to damage these things. Yeah, I mean they're they're. I mean that's the funny thing. Like sometimes we'll have people come into the office and they'll like hold a watch and they're like, I don't like yo, like Navy SEALs wore this. Like you could jump out of an airplane with this. Like it's it's good. I mean outside of like falling off of a motorcycle and scraping your wrist against the ground at some horrific speed, like you're not gonna. It's gonna be pretty hard to damage this yeah. stuff. Um, here, a couple more questions. What watch would you take a long time? Oh, what watch took you a long time to fall in love with? I know what mine was. Yeah, yours is a fifty-four oh two. Yep, exactly right. What about what about you? Uh, 
Um, I would say white gold day dates. Ooh, yeah. I did not like white gold day dates for a really long time. I was, I didn't, I didn't get it. I was like, what's the point of this? Why am I going to wear a gold watch? Nobody knows that it's gold. Uh, I didn't. I was like, this is pointless. Um, but now I really like them. I totally understand them. Very under under stated watch um, especially with like stone dials or uh, like black dials I think that they're very beautiful and it's a it's a internal feeling that you kind of get when you wear it because you can feel the weight you see like the, the color difference it's more white compared to steel um, it's just a very beautiful metal and uh, those are a watch that have really come around on. cool uh, maybe we'll do what maybe like two more questions and then we'll, we'll close it out Cool. Um, all right. So, um, are NATO straps out the window? Um, I would say no. I was wearing a watch in the earlier part of the week on a NATO strap. I think this is the time to kind of wear NATO straps. And obviously in LA, yeah. it's pretty warm. So I kind of like that. Um, a little bit lighter. It kind of like lightens up a, a piece where if you're wearing a watch on a bracelet, it can kind of get like sticky. I drive, yeah. we, we drive older cars. And so like my car doesn't have air conditioning. I'm typically, uh, what, would, what would you say that? I don't want to say it. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm like spitzed a little bit normally. Uh, you're sweating. Yeah, like yeah. a little bit. Like, so my wrist, you know, like I look kind of like having something I like a little bit lighter. I would say NATO straps are definitely kind of like an iconic staple classic. I think oh. NATO straps had their moment though, where everybody's like everything on NATO. And you're like, I okay. I don't think they'll really go out of style. I mean, you were just wearing a NATO strap yesterday. Yeah. Um, I don't wear them that often, but like I respect them and I like them. And some watches you have to wear on NATO straps, which I think is really cool. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, maybe one or two more here. What is the oldest sub reference you would go for every day? Uh, swim, uh, every day swim safe. safe. Yeah. I would, for me personally, if I were to like pick one, I'd say like a, an 80s, Later 80s, uh, 5513, no date sub, glossy dial, but still, you know, uh, acrylic crystal. I think, you know, trip lock crown, right? Like that, that you could you pressure test that watch and have it be. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would say something similar, totally. I mean, this 1680 has been pressure tested. You could go swimming with this as well. It also has a trip lock crown. I would say matte dial sub, but you you are definitely risking the watch by swimming with it, um, even if it's been pressure tested, um, just in case you like leave the crown out or something like that. So you really have to be conscious if that's a decision you want to make. Yeah. Um, like my 76 day just, I take this in the water, but I know it's been pressure tested and I know that my crown is in every time I go in. Yeah, and it's also like a thing too, like for me, like if I'm wearing a watch that I'm going into like the pool with, before I get in the water, like I notice that I'm always like checking the crown to see if yeah. it's down. Definitely. So I think it's, Make sure it's tightened down. Good point. I think it's a, a conscious being just conscious about what you're wearing and then just kind of checking your crown. Um, okay. Maybe one more then we're, then we're done here. Uh, let's see how, uh, why does Tyler look sad in this picture? <laughs> um, okay. So, uh, da, 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 da. Um, we already went through Tyler's favorite. What's your favorite color? Uh, green or orange? Probably. Oh my God, the phone. Um, green or orange, yeah. Uh, let me scroll up too and see if there's a few more things that we missed. Um, sorry, we got a lot of questions and people were like commenting and stuff. I think we covered pretty much everything. Um, Alex, I'm working on your red service uh, 1680. Uh, so that's kind of a cool watch. We were talking about that. I, th I thought that was kind of a, an interesting topic. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe we'll save that one for, for next time. So um, in any case, guys, thanks for tuning in. Um, we'll see you next week. We're going to continue doing this and we'll probably do it from the road too. We're going to figure out how to like kind of do these like Instagram, YouTube live sessions where we just kind of answer your questions and engage with you guys directly and um, just kind of keep doing that. So Thanks for tuning in, guys, and uh, we'll see you Thanks. in the next one. Ciao.